Well, good morning, everybody. It is wonderful to see you on a really, really nice Easter Sunday morning. I got up this morning and the sun was shining bright and it wasn't too cold and it wasn't windy and just beautiful. Now, I've told you before, I am a church kid. I was raised in church. And every once in a while, have you ever done something that you realized was remarkably stupid? <laughs> well, at least one of you has. <laughs> I, I, I've done it repeatedly. But I was probably college age before I realized why Christians went to sunrise services on Easter. I figured out that it had nothing to do with the time of day. It was a play on words. Because on Easter Sunday morning, that's when the sun rose. And part of me says, yeah, the sun rises every morning. But it's spelled differently. And then it occurred to me that I'd been in church all my life and never figured that out and I was embarrassed. It was like when I was approaching 30 and realized why a newlywed was a newlywed. Because they were newly wed? Yeah. I don't know. It's just some of the stuff that goes on that you don't pay attention to. Of course, today is Easter Sunday, the day that we followers of Jesus, that we Christians celebrate what is the central point in all of human history? And by central point, I mean everything that happened before Easter Sunday looked forward to Easter Sunday, and everything that has happened since looks back at Easter Sunday. When I was a kid, the long-term calendar was broken into two sections, B.C. and A.D. Now they've changed it. It's BCE and ADE. Instead of before Christ and Annus Domingo, which is the year of God, now it's before the common era and after the common era. You know when the common era starts? Yeah. With Jesus. <laughs> they can change the name, but they can't change the way the world works. And this is the central point in all of human history the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Last week, we looked at what was called Palm Sunday. That's the day that we remember and celebrate Jesus' entry into Jerusalem and the start of the chain of events that would lead to his death and resurrection. We saw how each year, the nation of Israel celebrated God delivering them from the bondage and the rule of the Egyptians. We saw how each year, there we go. They were more and more eager for God to finally deliver them from the bondage and the rule of the Roman Empire. For some reason, the Israelite people did not like being ruled by other folks. And they were ready. Through the entire Old Testament, God had promised them that they would be delivered. He had promised that he would send a person to deliver them again. That person was known as the Messiah, and they were ready. Do you remember when you were a kid and you got Thanksgiving out of the way and you started building up momentum toward Christmas? If you were a sneaky kid like me, you started leaving the toy ads around the house open to the particular pages that you were interested in because you wanted to make sure mom and dad knew what you were wanting for Christmas. In my house, that never helped. <laughs> but you got more and more eager for Christmas. And I can remember as a kid on Christmas morning, waking up bright and early, ready to tear into those presents. Then as I got a little older, bright and early got later and later. And then I got kids, and I started getting up bright and early, waiting for the kids to get up. And they would get up, and they'd come in, and they'd get their presents because the anticipation couldn't let them sleep. 
as they got older and older, bright and early got later and later. But the Israelite people were ready to be delivered. They were looking for someone to deliver them. They were looking for someone who fit the qualifications that the prophecies set out about who was going to deliver them. They were ready to overthrow the Romans and establish their own kingdom to restore the natural order of things. All they needed was the long prophesied, long awaited Messiah to lead them. They had been misled before, but they knew that God always keeps his promises. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the people knew that he met all of the criteria prophesied for hundreds of years. They knew the words Jesus had spoken about his kingdom, and they knew about the miracles he had done demonstrating his authority. It's easy to make claims. It's hard to back them up. And Jesus had done some amazing things to back up what he said. They were confident that finally Jesus was the guy. Now that may not be exactly how they said it, but it's how I would say it. That Jesus, the one on the donkey coming into town, he's the guy. And they knew it. As we found out last week, they were 100% right but they were also 100% wrong. Because what they were looking for was not what Jesus came to provide. Jesus knew that. He said he knew that they misunderstood and didn't accept what he really had come to do. In Luke 9.41, well, let's see, this is gonna remind us what day it was because I forgot to push my clicker. <laughs> Thank you. Is everybody clear now? Okay, okay. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 41, it says, But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, Jesus began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late, and peace is hidden from your eyes. They had made their choice. They were looking for a political Messiah. And in doing so, they were ignoring the one that God sent. Because Jesus was not sent to fix their politics. Jesus was heartbroken because the people were convinced that their problem was the world that they lived in and the people around them. They wanted their circumstances changed. They wanted their world changed. And God had bigger plans. God wanted, (coughs) excuse me, God wanted to change them. Have you ever wondered how a city full of people could welcome an all-conquering hero with an incredible celebration only to have them put him to death a few days later? That has bugged me as long as I've been in church which is starting from day three of my life. How could the same people who cheered and basically attempted to worship Jesus as their savior turn around and kill him a few days later? The main reason I've studied and read so much about this historic event is because it doesn't make sense. I like things to make sense. I know that most of the stuff people do, at least in their mind, makes sense. If we can figure out why it makes sense, we can figure out what's really happening. But picture this, Jesus entered the city to the cheers of those claiming him as the Messiah, They were expecting him to overthrow the Roman government. Now, they were ready for their circumstance to change. Now, 
And if you look at a map of the temple in Jerusalem, right next to the temple is the Roman garrison where the guards stay. And the road that Jesus was on goes straight there. And they were ready for him to go into where the Roman authorities were staying and take care of them. Now, folks, if you can stand on a boat and tell the weather to change and the weather changes, you can go into the garrison where the Roman authorities are and take care of stuff. If you can stand in a crowd of 5,000 men, which means there were at least 5,000 women and probably 10,000 kids, and feed them with a kid's lunch and have 12 baskets of food left over, you can walk into the garrison and take care of the Romans. If you can stand outside your friend Lazarus' tomb, who's been dead for three days, and tell him to wake up and come out, and he does, you can take care of the Romans. Look where Jesus went. The first place he went after they greeted him in Jerusalem. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people buying and selling animals for sacrifice. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He didn't go to the Romans to take care of them. He went to church. And he wasn't happy. Jesus said to them, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you've turned it into a den of thieves. All of a sudden, it was very clear that Jesus had a problem with a group of people. But the group of people he had the problem with wasn't the Romans. It was the religious folks the folks who had rigged this system to where it benefited them, the folks that had turned religion into something that makes them feel superior to other people. This is who Jesus had a problem with. Are you starting to see why he may have ticked a few people off? He may have ticked a few important people off. I've seen in our country over the last several years, there aren't too many emotions more powerful than disappointment. And when we expect something to happen, and you've said it was going to happen, and you don't deliver, we get angry. People don't change. The people 2,000 years ago were the same. Jesus didn't go after the Romans. He went after them. He went after their temple, their traditions, and their livelihoods. And it didn't take long to severely disappoint and greatly offend the Jewish people, especially their religious leaders. All of us should take the time to read what the Bible tells us about the events of the week of Easter, what we call Holy Week, and see what Jesus was really doing in one week. So many of the Bible stories you've heard, especially if you grew up in Sunday school, happened that week. But we don't put them all together. We don't see what Jesus was doing. Jesus dealing with the Roman Empire is not what we needed. He was here to change us. And to change us, Jesus had to die. We needed Jesus to die. So why does Jesus' death matter so much? It matters so much because the relationship that God had created his people to have with him was broken. The Bible tells us God created people because it made him happy. God created people because he wanted a relationship with us. God created people because he loves us. And from almost the very beginning, 
We broke that relationship. We broke it, and we couldn't fix it. I can remember as a kid breaking things and not having a clue how to fix them. I can remember as a kid taking stuff apart just for fun and not having any idea how to put it back together. One of my favorite memories with our daughter Angela who turned 24 this week. I don't know how that happened. (laughs) I was sitting at the little desk we had in our house, and she was crawling, and one of her favorite toys that she slept with and carried everywhere was a pink glow worm. Do you guys remember glow worm? Little stuffed animal, when you squeeze it, the head lights up. And she had glow worm the way she usually did, with glow worm's hat in her mouth, and she was crawling on the floor. And she comes over to me, and she hits my foot. And I look down, and I say, hey, Angela. And she takes glow worm, and she holds it up to me, and shakes her head. I thought, huh? And she holds glow worm up, and she shakes her head. And I picked it up, and I squeezed it, and the head didn't light up. As a tiny little kid, she knew glowworm was broken and she couldn't fix it. But she knew someone who could. And so daddy took it, unzipped the back, pulled the cover off, pulled the AA battery out, put a AA battery in, put it back in, squeezed it, head lit up. She grabbed it and crawled away. She didn't even say thank you. Sometimes we break things and we don't know how to fix them. Or you remember what the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 6.23. He says, the wages of sin is death. Well, that's awful harsh. We don't get to set the rules. We're not God. And what sin earns, the wages of sin, what sin earns is death, which is separation from God. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Why did Jesus have to die? Because we sinned. And to pay that price, somebody's got to die. And that's harsh. But that's the way it is. Our broken relationship, God fixed it. He fixed what we broke but couldn't fix because that's what he wanted to do. That's how much he loves us. That is why we celebrate. In Romans chapter 3, the Apostle Paul says, yet God in his grace freely makes us right in his sight. Do we earn the ability to be right in his sight? No, we can't, because not a person that's ever been alive has been perfect. But God freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sin. What Jesus was doing was paying the penalty we had incurred through our sin. We just wanted him to fix our circumstances. God had much bigger plans. goes on in verse 25 for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin people are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life shedding his blood we can't make ourselves right with God but if we accept the fact that Jesus did it for us that makes us right with God That's what we're celebrating today on Easter Sunday. The lengths that God went to, the price that God paid, the love God expressed when Jesus, God the Son, made it possible for us again to be with God, God the Father, and have God, God the Spirit, live inside of us. That's why we celebrate Easter every year. In 1 Peter Chapter 1, starting in verse 2. 
Peter says, God the Father knew you and chose you long ago, and his spirit has made you holy. As a result, you've obeyed him and have been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. May God give you more and more grace and peace. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's by his great mercy that we've been born again. We wanted God to change our circumstance. God wants to change us. We get to be born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation and we have a priceless inheritance. Priceless is one of those weird words that means exactly the opposite of what it looks like it means. If I walked into Albertsons and things were priceless, I'd just load up the cart and walk out. Because if they don't have a price, that means I can take them. It's not how it works. Priceless means there is no amount of anything we can get that could buy it. It is not for sale. Our inheritance cannot be measured. It says, an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. The inheritance God has for us can't wear out. We can't lose it. Someone can't steal it, and we can't break it because of what Jesus did. Rhonda was joking about garages being full of stuff. We've got a whole downstairs room at our house that's full of Christmas presents that Rhonda and I spent good money on over the last 25 years. I can't believe that we bought that many Barbies. <laughs> but they're there. They're not in the same shape they were when we bought them. The outfits that we bought aren't as nice as they were when we bought them. Some of the stuff we bought isn't even usable anymore. We still have VHS tapes down there. <laughs> I don't know how many people in this room remember VHS tapes. They don't look as nice as when we bought them. They certainly wouldn't look good on my big TV. Why are they all fuzzy and out of focus? Everything we buy, everything we collect, everything we attain gets old, breaks down. The inheritance that God has for us because of our faith in Jesus is beyond the reach of change and decay. It doesn't break down. Our broken relationship God fixed it. And when God fixes it, I bet everybody in here has had a friend who you've had a little bit of a falling out with. And after you make up, you may wonder for years whether or not you've really made up. I've been around Bethel a long time. I've talked with a lot of married couples. And I've heard a lot of married couples talking about things that happened 20 years ago that still tick them off. That relationship is not fixed. Otherwise, people still wouldn't be bringing up that stuff. That relationship is just put in a place where we're ignoring things or trying to. But man, if you tick somebody off, they come back like that. Do you know that God never, ever does that to us? Oh, there's plenty of junk I did that was wrong. And sometimes I'll even bring it up to him. 
And the only thing he has to say is, Mike, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, what are you, stupid? (laughs) Isn't that what we're saying when we remind God of the things that we've done? He says he's forgotten them. Now, there are lots of things I forget. But I only know I forget them because I do eventually remember them. God doesn't. Our relationship is fixed. We broke it. God fixed it. That's what happened. Jesus died to pay the price for our sin and God raised him from the dead to prove his victory over death. It's the most important event in history. It is not an allegory. It is not a metaphor. It is not a symbol. It is true. I'll close out this morning with an excerpt from an article I recently read by a lady named Tim Harrison Warren. She's an Anglican priest in Pittsburgh. And one of the things that tends to surprise a lot of people is when they're talking with or they get to know a minister. And we all have these ideas in our head about what ministers are really like. Now, I've never had any misconceptions about people thinking I'm better than I am because I have children. (laughs) And I learned early on that there are no secrets when you have children. (laughs) My kids have grown up here at Bethel. Right after they were born, they've been in church. They grew up in the nursery. They grew up in the preschool. They grew up in Sunday school. They grew up in the youth group. They grew up, they went to preschool here. They went to school here. They went to high school here. They work here. And I can remember early on, Wendy, our oldest daughter, may have been in second, third grade, maybe. Is that about the first grade? Rhonda's going, first grade. And I had missed a couple days of school. And I came back on campus and one of our teachers sees me across campus and very discreetly says, hey, Mike, I hear you had diarrhea. (laughs) And I said, oh, yeah? And he says, yeah, Wendy told us. If I had ever suspected it, I knew right then there were going to be no secrets in our house. (laughs) But a lot of us have these ideas of what ministers are like. And sometimes we may be a little surprised when we find out that ministers are a lot more like us than we expect them to be. And so when I hear the term Anglican priest, I have a certain vision in my head of what an Anglican priest might be. And I loved reading what this Anglican priest, Reverend Warren, had to say. She writes this, I am a Christian today, not because it answers all my questions about the world or about our current suffering. It does not. And not because I think it is a nice, coherent, moral order by which to live my life. And not because I grew up this way or have fond feelings about felt boards and singing hymns. And not because it motivates justice or helps me to know how to vote. I am a Christian because I believe in the resurrection. If it isn't true, to hell with all of it. On the other hand, if Jesus did in fact come back from the dead on a quiet Sunday morning some 2,000 years ago, then everything is changed. 
our beliefs, our ethics, our politics, our time, our relationships. If it is true, then the resurrection of Jesus is the most determinative fact of the universe, the center point of history. The resurrection is ultimately truer and more lasting than death or destruction, violence or viruses. It's truer too than our celebration of it, however beautiful, however meager. I wish all of you a happy Easter today. And I consider it the greatest privilege to share this journey with you. Because folks, it's true. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for giving us the ability to remember what you've done for us. Sometimes we can be so self-centered. Sometimes we can be so focused on the things we think are important that we forget what you've actually done for us and what you've accomplished for us. Sometimes we think that we have to do something to earn our relationship with you. And that's not true. Jesus already did it. All we have to do is accept what Jesus did. So Father, as we remember, as we celebrate what Jesus did for us and why, we thank you, we focus on you, and we appreciate the life that you've given us and the fact that you came to change us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are still not passing buckets or communion elements. We have them all along here in the front. We have them in the back. And we need you to get up and go get one. They're these little self-contained jobbers. They're sanitary. If you don't wish to take communion, you don't have to. Jobbers, it's an official term. Maybe if someone around you isn't mobile, you could ask if you could get them one. I'll warn you ahead of time, there are two flaps. And we'll lift up the first one first to get to the tasty and not at all to get the um, wafer that Pastor Mike referred to as a pool noodle flavor it'll be nice when we can go back to having goldfish does everyone have one seated again and if you want to go ahead and tear off that top flap go right ahead maybe you could tear mine off for me thank you all right doing this to remember him The Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians about what we know as communion. And this is a reenactment, a remembering of what Jesus did with his disciples at what was called the Last Supper. Yet another one of those Bible events that takes place the week between Palm Sunday and Easter. And it was the last time he was with all his disciples before he died and he shared a meal with them. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, 
for I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. His body that was given for us was what the prophet Isaiah was referring to when he talked about Jesus taking on the sicknesses and the diseases for us. His body was broken so that ours wouldn't have to be. And then he says, do this in remembrance of me. Please take the bread as we remember what Jesus, that Jesus' body was broken for us. Paul goes on in verse 25. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant or the new agreement between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. This is the forgiveness of sin. This is the new agreement that God is making with his people. We don't have to perform. We don't have to act. We cannot earn his approval. But we can accept what Jesus did for us. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. So please take the cup as a reminder that Jesus' blood was shed for us.